Hello everyone, welcome to the Green Effect Podcast. We are episode number 27, and again, part two, we've got Stephen Woodworth, Conservative Party of Canada candidate for Kitchener Centre, is back on. So, uh, before we get into what we're going to talk to Stephen about, let's not forget our show sponsor, Ignite Volleyball. Don't forget, all registrations are still open for the fall session for our Sparks Fire and Magic program. That is age 4 to uh, age 12. A lot of fun for these programs. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see our promo video for it. Um, Kids have a blast. They really learn how to love the game. To register, uh, visit ignitevolleyball.ca. Again, ignitevolleyball.ca. And that's for anyone in the Waterloo region or even, wait, we'll take you from Guelph, London or anywhere else. On to what we're going to talk to Stephen about. So a few things. Uh, We're going to talk about CRA accountability. Um, Lots of question around the accountability of CRA. That's the Canada Revenue Agency Auditor. Um, If anyone from CRA is listening, uh, I did not come up with this question. I love you guys. And uh, I am not questioning you. I like you guys a lot. And uh, not my question. But we do have a question we posed to Stephen on this one income splitting. Uh, We're going to talk about uh, the elimination of income splitting. I have a really neat twist on it uh, that I never thought about. Uh, It was presented to me and I'm going to ask Stephen about it. And finally, deficits and the national debt. We're focused on one, not the other. Is there not a way to reduce one that we can take some of these interest payments and put them towards uh, more important things? few very important topics with Stephen. Without further ado, here we go. Welcome to the Green Effect Podcast. Finance, life, business, and everything in between. And now, your host, Stephen Green. Okay, so the what I'm hearing is that, switching gears now, bringing it a little bit more home, uh, CRA auditors. Okay, so what I'm hearing from some of my tax partners, I say tax partners, accounting partners, is that there's not quite the same accountability to a CRA auditor than there is to an accountant, a a citizen, we'll say. Not saying auditors are not citizens, but (laughs) to someone who's who's had their taxes looked at. So I'm hearing there's, if there's a mistake made, um, if something goes wrong, they're like, well, sorry even though they flip the life upside down of the individual, there's just no accountability there. What, what are you seeing in that, in that regard? Well, I, I don't have, um, my complete notes on this particular issue. Uh, but I can tell you, uh, what I learned. I can tell you from memory what I learned when I did look at it, uh, because, um, I regret to say it's not a new issue. It is a perennial issue, and uh, it was brought to my attention when I was a member of Parliament, oh, probably five or six years ago. At that time, I met with the local uh, manager of the CRA office in Kitchener uh, at that time. I'm not sure that office still maintains the same jurisdiction that it did. I think so. Uh, But uh, at that time, uh, the uh, audits were being directed locally out of the Kitchener office, and I met with that manager because I had more than one constituent who came to me with that complaint. And uh, I uh, learned uh, all I could about the procedures that were in place, and indeed there are internal procedures by which uh, CRA frontline auditors are held to account by senior level people in the administration. Uh, also, the, the experience level of auditors, uh, in, at least working out of the Kitchener office, was quite high. They were, they were hired with uh, always uh, two or three or four years of uh, experience. They weren't just coming fresh out of school. Uh, and they were supervised by people with 10 or more years experience, at least at that time. Uh, I satisfied myself that there were at least reasonable processes in place for auditors to be supervised and for their decisions to be reviewed when necessary. Now, 
couple of qualifications to that. Number one, it's, it's cold comfort to a citizen whose life has been turned upside down, as you pointed out, uh, by an auditor who may disagree with the citizen on the interpretation of a, of a, uh, a point of audit. I mean, there, there are auditing standards and there are uh, accounting practices which are not exactly able to be recorded in every detail and do require some judgment. And reasonable people can disagree on some of these issues. And so it's cold comfort to a citizen who disagrees with an auditor uh, that the auditor has in fact been supervised and held to account and had someone else uh, put their eyeballs on it and come to the same conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and secondly, there is a process in government that I've observed frequently, uh, which you might describe under the category of circling the wagons. You know, no matter how many levels of interior review you have, uh, there's kind of a sympathy between fellow travelers, uh, if I could put it that way, between the frontline auditor and his or her uh, supervisor, who was once a frontline auditor. And that kind of sympathy is hard for a citizen to look at and, and uh, take calmly, you know. Of course. Uh, and, and I don't deny that sometimes that will skew the results. But what's the solution? When, uh, when a decision is made by a frontline auditor and it's uh, reviewed and uh, discussed uh, by their supervisors and it's upheld, uh, what's the solution? Um, there are two avenues which come to mind. One is that the citizen can go running to their buddy, the MP, and the MP can order the auditor to come to a different conclusion. Mm -hmm because uh, he likes the citizen and he wants the citizen's vote and or uh, political contributions at election time. So what's the issue with that solution? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the issue is uh, that at least until Justin Trudeau came along, Canada was a nation of laws. Yeah. And uh, we, we didn't make uh, legal decisions on the basis of political influence, at least until Justin Trudeau came along mm -hmm. and tried to do that in the SNC-Lavalin case. And by and large, uh, I'm still a believer that decisions should be made on the basis of law, not on the basis of political influence. Of Who do you know? You know, I was often frustrated as an MP because the ministers in, a, in the government that I supported were rule of law people. And I could see decisions that I thought were clearly wrong made by the frontline officers, and I would appeal to the minister and say, this is wrong. And they would say, I'm sorry, I cannot, for political reasons, overrule that. And we've exhausted all of the reasonable internal reviews. So the other solution is you go to court. And believe me, nobody wants to go to court. You only go to court when it's really worth your while financially. Absolutely. And when you go to court, you take the risk that the judge might disagree with your interpretation and agree with the other interpretation. But that's how we decide legal questions in Canada, mm -hmm. by appealing to impartial, nonpartisan, nonpolitical judges. Uh, we don't use political influence. At least that's the way it used to be up until the current government. And, and one wonders how far the problem of, of uh, eroding rule of law has gone with the Trudeau government. We don't really know. It's there at the highest level. We don't know if it's gone down to other levels. So, so I sympathize with citizens. And, and here's what I'll do as a member of parliament. If you come to me with such an issue, I'll investigate it. I'll try and get to the core of it. I will try to help you refine your presentation with the skills that I've learned as a lawyer over the years to, uh, to show that your position is the correct legal position. I'll help you articulate that to the people who are the decision makers. And, and often I've been able to help people doing that as a member of parliament. And, and sometimes we can persuade uh, those frontline government decision makers to alter their decision by bringing new evidence to the fore or how, whatever it might be. That's what I will do as a member of parliament. Yeah, and then that's how the system is supposed to be designed yeah. at the end of the day, yeah. right? But, but I won't and can't uh, order a bureaucrat who's made a decision that he thinks 
or she thinks complies with the law to do something that they think would not comply with the law. Mm -hmm. Only a judge can decide whether they've made the right or wrong decision. Uh, now, we could, and I'd be quite in favor, by the way, of also uh, imposing greater penalties on the government when people have to go to court and are found to be in the right. Mm -hmm. Cost awards in such cases are, in my opinion, inadequate. And they should inflict a penalty on the government, which should there then act as a deterrent to those uh, folks who are circling the wagons, uh, if that's what they're doing. Yeah, I like that. And that's that's accountability, right? Yeah. That's a very, very simple. So I'm sorry to give you quite a, a long and involved answer to that question, but no, that's but I understand the way what it you're is. Saying. No, and, and it, I like I, I like that context. I understand that context, and I think that's that's important to know, right? It's important to understand that process yeah. and. Kind of like when we talked earlier about the uh, the different ways to campaign and stuff. I think there's there's some context there. So exactly. no, that's yeah. that's but, fantastic. But really, what's important is that a member of parliament should be able to understand what's at issue, mm -hmm. and should be able to try to inform the constituent of how to put their best evidence forward, and should go to bat, in fact, and try to convince the decision makers with that evidence. But but it's convincing only. It's not ordering. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think that's, uh, that's an important difference to understand, right? Yeah. So, so th this, this next point I want to ask you about, it's, I thought about it, and I know that uh, it's in place now. But then someone put it to me in a different way. And so I'm going to, I'm going to explain what the point is, and then I'll throw it the, the spin that they put on it. So we've eliminated in income splitting in Canada. Okay, you can't do it anymore. And I thought, originally I thought, okay, fair enough, income splitting, and I'm sure there's another, t another tax strategy involved or whatever. But one person put it to me really well, and they said, we're decreasing the value of whoever is staying home, maybe to raise family, take care of elders, whatever the case may be. We are uh, decreasing their value by not allowing this income splitting. And I never thought of it that way. I just thought income splitting was just another great tax strategy. But then I thought of this and I'm thinking, so I know for me, my wife's not working right now, right? And I think, you know, if, if we had that opportunity, it would be great. So give me some more um, thoughts on this income splitting. I sure. believe the liberals brought it in if I'm not mistaken, a few years ago, right? They abolished uh, some of the previous t income splitting tra tax measures. Right. So when I, and I say brought it in, I mean, I mean eliminated it. Yeah. So give me some thoughts on this. Sure. And it's, it's really, really interesting because actually uh, the term that you're using of uh, income splitting actually uh, has been implemented in two entirely different ways in the past. And I'm pretty sure that what you're referring to when you talk about income splitting is the ability of a business owner to uh, sprinkle business income among family members uh, through issuing dividends on a, a share structure. Uh, and that definitely is one um, uh, way to income split. And I'm going to return to that in a moment because that's the one that the liberals kind of um, began to um, uh, limit. And I'll return to that in a minute. But actually, uh, the previous government came up with a different form of income splitting. And that is uh, an outright straight split of income between any two married people with children under the age of 18 who would be allowed to equalize their incomes for tax purposes in the same way that we do with uh, pension income splitting for seniors. Yep. We wanted to extend that to uh, younger families with children under the age of 18 in order to, in fact, recognize the value of those uh, people who were staying at home to look after the children in exactly the way that you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. That was exactly our rationale for doing it. The uh, Trudeau Liberals also did away with that income splitting. Mm -hmm. 
and it was a big blow to many families who were benefiting from it and who were counting on it. And in fact, that's, that's actually a feature of the way the Liberals did away with both of those forms of income splitting, is they didn't really transition it very well. And even the people who were sprinkling income through a dividend issuance uh, were caught off guard and unawares uh, and uh, had no way to prepare for the extra tax burden that was thrust upon them when the Liberals did this. The Liberals showed a complete disregard for people who had ordered their affairs based on the previous rules, in my opinion. So why did they do this then? What was the reason? Well, um, if you'll permit me an, an unprofessional comment for a moment, I, as, a, as a professional, whenever my clients always ask me, why does the other side do such things? <laughs> I always say to them, we will never know because you can't read minds, you know? Sure. Well, uh, go ahead but, and read a mind if you want. Well, <laughs> what I can do is I can offer you some uh, possible explanations. Uh, one is that uh, the, the Liberal government, uh, when it began, um, um, was still trying to uh, find ways to pay for all its spending. I mean, they, they were completely unable to control their spending and so they were trying to squeeze every last dollar out of taxpayers that they could and they felt that business owners and entrepreneurs were uh, an unsympathetic target that they could uh, they could punish the business classes by increasing taxes on the business classes and uh, that uh, that would sell well with their base well uh, they went a lot further in fact than just this provision and, and tried other things, which they subsequently had to retract because there was such a, a hue and cry, but I don't think they retracted this particular one. So they, they were just trying to squeeze extra uh, tax uh, revenue out of what they thought would be an unsympathetic or vulnerable demographic. But, but secondly, I'm kind of, um, I understand the principle of it is that if people aren't um, actually uh, working for a business, uh, then uh, it distorts the market a little bit to uh, spread income uh, between them as if they were earning it, right? So in, in principle, there is sort of a di market distortion going on, uh, which um, we can all understand. Uh, and, and so um, in principle, I'm not against trying to uh, shut down things which are market distorting loopholes, if I can put it that right. way. It's a good way to put it, yeah. Uh, they didn't actually invest, uh, their, the, you know, a, a child didn't actually invest money in the company. They didn't invest time and effort in the company, and yet they're getting dividends which are earnings from the company. Uh, so it's, a, it's a kind of a gift, if you will, and, you know, I can follow all that through, but it's still a bit market distorting. Mm -hmm. I really liked the idea that the previous government came up, which is let's do it up front and honestly by just saying, look, let's equalize the incomes in a household, at least if, they're, if they're, they have the legitimate reason that they're raising children under the age of 18. Yep. That's honest and upfront. Um, so in any event, uh, by offering up that second explanation, I'm not trying to say that what the liberals did was justified. I'm just saying that's probably what the bureaucrats would have told them to justify it. Yeah. Whether you agree or not is up to you. And certainly, even if you agreed with it, the implementation was very flawed and gave people no notice or grandfathering or ability to really adjust yeah. their planning. And grandfathering, that's an, that's an interesting thought too, right? Yeah. For someone, for, I can say from a tax planning perspective, if people have been tax planned that direction for retirement or whatever, then that can be... Yeah. Here today, gone tomorrow can be a tough way to do it. But, exactly. But that that is, I can think of mortgage world, and you know, for the last eight years. Yeah. So I've been, I've been doing I've been in banking twenty two years, but doing mortgage specific for eight or nine now, and it's uh, that's just the way things have gone. Where it's here's the rule today, and it starts tomorrow, and yeah. figure it out, right? Yeah. So I, I should be cautious about that. You know what? Because I actually didn't look uh, so closely into the weeds to see whether, in fact, there was any grandfathering on this. But I have the general impression that there wasn't. I don't think there was, yeah. Uh, and uh, maybe there should have been. Uh, that's, you know. If there was grandfathering, I don't think there would be, um, 
the concern around it. Probably not. Yeah, because then you can plan accordingly if need be. I mean, if, you, if you've never done it, you don't know what's there if you've never done it before, yeah. right? So, um, okay, so I've, I've got this next question, and I'm going to read this one verbatim because uh, I just, I wouldn't do it justice if I didn't. So the question is, why are we always focused on an annual on our annual deficits and never develop a real plan to address the accumulated debt of the country? The country owes some money. Um, I believe I understand, and this is coming from the individual, I believe I understand uh, debt more than most people and the benefits it can provide true business owners and investors. I haven't seen much hope from the past conservative or liberal governments that they were capable of investing in a reasonable fashion for the country and don't like paying all the interest which could otherwise go to various social, health, defense, etc. projects. Right, right. So if, if you don't mind, I'd like to give you the simple answer, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to give you the more um, nuanced and contextual answer. Absolutely. Uh, the very simple answer that uh, I hope everybody would understand is that it's impossible uh, to worry about draining the swamp when you're up to your hind end in alligators, you know? Uh, if you can't even balance uh, the budget, what possible hope do you have to uh, actually eliminate the national debt? Mm -hmm. That, I think, is what the writer or the question is suggesting, is why don't we actually develop a plan to eliminate the national debt instead of merely focusing on eliminating the annual deficit. Yep. And it's, it's a legitimate question, except that uh, you, uh, you know, one of the uh, seven habits of highly effective people from Covington's book mm -hmm. is that you have to do first things first. Yep. So we first have to actually eliminate the annual deficit. Uh, and until we do that, we can't worry about the, um, uh, the uh, national debt. Because mm -hmm. we're as long as we've got an annual deficit, we're still adding to it. Yeah. Now, the question uh, misses one point, and that is that there actually was a plan to eliminate the national debt. It was Conservative Party policy, at least uh, ten years ago, that when the budget was returned to balance, then uh, the further surpluses would be allocated at least in part toward paying down the national debt. Now, uh, that was before the Great Recession of 2008, the worst recession in 80 years, yep. and the government was compelled by the opposition uh, to engage in additional deficit stimulus spending, and then it took five years to uh, return the budget to balance again. But my hope would be that when we do uh, again return the budget to balance, we will return to that plan, and we will devote these, uh, a portion of the surpluses to paying down the national debt. Some of it we also were going to devote to reducing taxes. And of course, some of the surplus would have to be directed into new and necessary or worthwhile programming. But it was those three things that we were going to do when we returned the budget to balance and, in fact, started generating surpluses. So um, that begins or segues into the more nuanced answer, and, and it is that uh, if a, if a um, government is reducing, uh, has eliminated its uh, deficit and is showing a surplus, what do you do with the surplus? Mm -hmm. Uh, in a way, a surplus is evidence that you're taxing too much, right? If if you're not spending enough, yeah, or, well, uh, yeah. assuming that you've got your spending under control and, and rationally allocated, uh, and you're running a surplus, it's because you're taxing too much. Uh, although your question does make a good point uh, that you could tax extra in order to pay off the debt. And actually, I like that idea. I would be in favor of allocating a big part of any surplus to paying off the national debt. Uh, let me give you, to be the devil's advocate, the reason why uh, not everyone is as bullish about that as I am, or maybe your questioner was. And that is because in business, economists recognize 
that debt isn't necessarily a bad thing per se. You do borrow to purchase assets. And if it's borrowing for assets, asset uh, acquisition, it's not quite as bad as borrowing for ongoing program expenses. Right. Right. So, so you can kind of subdivide debt into that. And, and even when the Harper government went into debt in 2009 and 10, it was for the former, not the latter. It was not in order to fund program expenses. It was to fund asset acquisitions. So that is the uh, purchase of infrastructure. Right. Now, that definition of in infrastructure has been made elastic and stretched all of, out of all recognition by the Trudeau government. Mm -hmm. They're funding things as infrastructure, which are really not infrastructure. Like what? Like what we were talking about? Well, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, the um, uh, upgrading of um, Loblaw's uh, refrigerators, uh, $12 million dollars, uh, you know, that's not government infrastructure that, uh, mm -hmm. that the taxpayers should be paying for. The kind of infrastructure that the Harper government uh, funded were roads and bridges and uh, railways and uh, public transit acquisition, those kinds of public... By uh, definition. Things. That's right. Yeah. Uh, we're not out there to try and upgrade uh, Loblaw's refrigerators, at least in my opinion we shouldn't be. Um, but, but in any event, the distinction is valid between infrastructure and program spending. So to borrow for infrastructure acquisition is somewhat more acceptable than borrowing for ongoing program expenses. Well, you would expect infrastructure um, improvements would drive more of the economy, right? If we're talking roads and bridges exactly. and build, yeah, so that makes sense. Exactly. So, uh, and by the way, back on the question of what's uh, infrastructure spending, even the even the, the Harper government was giving out money for job creation projects mm -hmm. and calling it infrastructure, which it really isn't. Uh, so there, I mean, there are issues around figuring out that distinction. But, but all that said, uh, to be completely debt-free uh, isn't regarded as a goal by many economists. Now, I'll tell you what, I agree with the question that to be completely debt-free should be a goal mm -hmm. because debt costs money. Mm -hmm. Whenever the government of Canada borrows money, it's going to pay in the range of 25 to 3% per year interest on that. The, the Trudeau government has borrowed or added over $80 billion dollars to our national debt in the last four years alone. And, and that means if you multiply that, say, by 3%, $2.4 billion a year in extra interest service charge expense that could be paid to build affordable housing, for example, and deal with the supply side issue that we were talking about earlier. So to me, it's a reverse Robin Hood. When the government borrows money, it's going to end up paying people who are wealthy enough to lend money to the government. And you know who is going to get taxed uh, to pay that $2.4 billion a year? It's going to be lower and middle income Canadians' taxes that are going to be used to pay that those interest charges to people and groups that are wealthy enough to lend money to the government. It's a kind of a reverse wealth transfer. It's a reverse Robin Hood. Yeah. And, and so from my perspective, I'm very bullish on eliminating the national debt altogether. And I'm sympathetic with that point in the question. Uh, but I have to acknowledge that uh, most economists wouldn't agree with me on that point. Uh, and that there is a legitimate distinction between uh, infrastructure acquisition, uh, real infrastructure acquisition and program spending. And, and there is also something to be said for other uses of the surplus, such as lowering taxes or new programming. Yeah. It's interesting because it's like, when was the last time we were in a surplus situation? It's been a long time. And I think, so it's almost like if you ever get there, it'll be, uh, what do you do with the money? Like it's well, <laughs> actually, if I can, if you don't mind my correcting you a little bit, yeah. it's only been four years. There was a small surplus uh, in the uh, year ending uh, April. Um, uh, well, actually, you know what? You're right. 
I'm, I'm wrong. There would have been a small surplus in the fiscal year ending April uh, 2016, okay. except that uh, the liberals were elected uh, in October of 2015, mm-hmm. and they immediately went on a spending uh, binge, and that did result in another deficit. So I'm wrong. I'm sorry. We would have had a surplus in that year, but for the extra spending that the liberals layered on. Yeah. Well, maybe one day, like every other family in Canada, maybe we'll see some debt, uh, debt-free. debt Well, that's the world, conservative right? plan, although uh, originally the, the hope was that we could return to a balanced budget within two years. I think that that's been revisited, and uh, the analysis shows that it would be much too um, drastic uh, in program spending cuts to eliminate the deficit within two years. So I think probably you're looking at something more like five a five-year window uh, to get government uh, expenditures back under control federally. Well, Stephen, thank you very much for coming on. It's been great having you. If, uh, if you don't get to someone's door and, and knock on their door, how can they reach out to you? Well, uh, and this is a shameless plug. You can come up with whatever works for you. Thank you very much. And uh, (laughs) uh, in in the one area that I didn't prepare was to bring with me one of my brochures, which has my uh, office telephone number on it. So I I will give you actually my home number, which is public and listed. Okay. uh, And which anybody can use to get in touch with me. I was getting ready to hit Uh, the pause button. Just I'm like, no, 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 no. no." Well, I'm going to give you my home number. It's on. um, It it's public, and uh, so far at least uh, people have treated it respectfully. Good. And that's five one nine seven four three one two six three. Uh, but you know what? People today more and more communicate by email. Mm-hmm. And in that respect, my website is uh, stephenwoodworth.ca. And Stephen with a PH. Uh, that's correct. As a Stephen with a PH, I know we got to explain correct. that every single time. Uh, yep. And uh, just Woodworth. So Stephen Woodworth, all one word, dot CA is the website. And the email is contact at stephenwoodworth.ca. Excellent. Uh, so they can reach out to me uh, in that way also. And you're on social media too, right? There's That's Facebook. Correct. Are you Facebook? on Instagram? I am, but I'm not a heavy user of Instagram. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, it is, I think, um, uh, Woodworth uh, CPC. Yep. And uh, Facebook uh, also uh, uh, Woodworth CPC. The uh, Twitter account had to be at Woodworth One CPC. <laughs> Uh, so there's another Woodworth out there. Well, uh, actually, it was because we uh, couldn't close off the old Woodworth CPC. <laughs> so we st- had to start a new one, Woodworth 1 CPC. But by and large, Woodworth CPC will find me. Oh, social media is fun like that, yeah. let me tell you. So, again, thank you very much thank for uh, for coming on. And until next time, everyone, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. And there you go, Stephen Woodworth, our first federal guest completed. Thanks so much for listening. Don't forget to follow me on both Facebook and Twitter with the handles RBC Stephen Green, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to the Green Effect Podcast. Subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Google Play so you catch the next episode. And don't forget to leave a review. Much appreciated.